Hello and welcome to another episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Howes Whitecross, and I'd like to welcome all of you tuning in through Zoom and Facebook Live tonight. As always, you can communicate with us through the Zoom chat room and ask your questions to the speaker throughout the webinar using the Q&A box. Please remember, if you're using the chat box, to select the all panelists and attendees option so that everybody tuning in can see your message, not just the panelists this evening. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, you can use the comment feed to send us your questions and our speaker will then answer these at the end of the webinar. Now let us know if you are tuning in on all major social media feeds by using the hashtag conservation conversations. If you've missed out on any of our previous webinars, you can catch up on the recordings on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel or listen via our new podcast available on all major streaming services. We'd like to encourage all of you listening to please visit our YouTube channel and click the subscribe button to help us grow the support of our webinar content on YouTube. Now, a big thank you to those of you who have continued to generously donate towards the production of these webinars using the Quicket Donations platform. All you have to do is simply scan the QR code and visit the Conservation Conversations website to find the link to our donations portal. Your contributions help us to keep these talks free for all to learn and enjoy. Now, BirdLife South Africa is excited to announce that we have several vacancies opening up at the moment. We're looking to recruit an assistant bookkeeper, two interns for our conservation division, as well as an assistant for our Angula project. And those of you who tuned in to Kisha's webinar earlier this year will know that Angula is one spectacular place to work. So if you know <laughs> any capable interns, please do let them know that they can head over to our BirdLife South Africa website and click on the vacancies tab to find out more about these exciting positions. Now I'd like to draw everyone's attention this evening to a very special opportunity that we are providing for birders in partnership with Eco Training. We're offering a long weekend of birding in the magical Makuleki concession from 26 to 29 November. This area in the extreme north of Kruger National Park is one of South Africa's best birding hotspots with a long list of specials like racket-tailed roller, Hell's Fishing Owl, Arno's Chat, two species of spine tail, and many other exciting species. This exciting weekend of birding has been intentionally timed to coincide with the National Birding Big Day, and you'll be treated to some wonderful guided activities as part of that day. Now, this area is usually reserved for those who can afford high-end lodges, but we've negotiated a special locals rate of just 5,400 Rand per person sharing for the three nights. This includes all of your food, all of your accommodation, guided drives and walks. And the only thing it doesn't include is your drinks. It also, and your concession fees. You'll also need to get yourself there, but if you can arrange your transport to and from the park, this really is a great deal. Spaces are limited to 20 participants and over half of these have already been taken. So make sure to book by emailing inquiries at ecotraining.co.za and if you have any further questions, you're also welcome to contact AV Tourism Project Manager and familiar face on Conservation <laughs> Conversations, Andrew DeBlock. Andrew will also be popping in during the weekend as he is coincidentally on leave in the Pafuri region during that time. So BirdLife South Africa really does look forward to welcoming you into the Makuleki concession very, very soon. And for those of you who don't know what Birding Big Day is, in November, we are just four weeks away from BirdLife South Africa's Birding Big Day. This is an annual challenge where you get to go out with your teams or on your own and try and log as many birds as you can in a 24 hour period. This exciting event is really open to anybody who wants to be super competitive or not. You can make it as fun or competitive as you would like to, but we really wanna try and get out and cover as many of the 850 odd regularly occurring species in South Africa. So be sure to play your part, join BirdLife South Africa and BirdLassa on this year's Birding Big Day and email Ernst Retiff on ernst.retiff at birdlife.org.za if you need any further information. Our final Jakarta Media Competition for November promises this month's winner an amazing collection of bird-related titles. You can enter the competition by visiting the Conservation Conversations website and clicking the competition link. Unfortunately, this is only open to South African-based viewers, but a big thank you to Jakarta Media for supporting our webinars this year and partnering with us 
to bring our viewers an amazing selection of prizes. And I'm sure those of you who were lucky enough to walk away with the previous month's prizes will certainly agree with that. And now I have the privilege of welcoming to your screens one of South Africa's top female scientists, a lady who has broken through the glass ceiling in the field of paleontology with a range of incredible discoveries and novel work on non-avian dinosaurs, as well as some early birds through her extensive analyses of fossilized materials across the world. Some of you may have been lucky enough to watch her talk on the evolution of birds during the virtual African bird fair this year. And she's assured me that what you're going to hear tonight is another very exciting talk that follows on from what she shared with us earlier this year. And I'd highly recommend going and watching that talk if you haven't seen it yet. Professor Anusia Chinsami Turan is based out of the Biological Sciences Department at the University of Cape Town and holds an A rating from the National Research Foundation, making her a top rated scientist in South Africa in the field of paleontology. She holds awards including the Department of Science and Technology's Distinguished Women Scientist, as well as an Academy of Sciences Gold Medal. Professor Chinsami Turin is a conservationist at heart and is currently BirdLife South Africa's honorary president and is also an ambassador for WWF South Africa. Despite her long list of scientific publications, she's also authored two popular books, The Fossils of Africa and Famous Dinosaurs of Africa, which have inspired a whole new generation of dinosaur enthusiasts, myself included. She also has two new books lined up for 2021, so be sure to watch this space. Now tonight, Prof Chintemi Turan will be unraveling the fossil world for us and teaching us how to unlock the biological mysteries of species from days gone by. A big welcome to Conservation Conversations, Prof. We are really looking forward to learning more about your incredible work. And I'd like to hand over to you now to please share your screen. Thanks so much for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Melissa. Let me try and get this going. There we go. Can you see that? Yes, we can, Prof. Thanks so much. Over to you. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you very much to all of you that are joining us this evening. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. And for those of you that did attend the Evolution of Bird talk that I had given about, a, about two months ago, you'll certainly see that this is going to be a different story. So let's begin. So this is going to be the structure of my talk. I'm going to very briefly talk about the diversification of Mesozoic birds. Then I'm going to talk about what happened after the Cretaceous um, tertiary, tertiary extinction event. What actually, um, after the big mass extinction event, what actually happened to birds. And then my focus is going to be on the extinct giant birds and La the fourth aspect that I will talk about will be um, my, um, some of my research, and I thought that I'll focus particularly on the dodo and on the dromornithids, which are the thunderbirds. So we're going to have that. And then lastly, I'll say something briefly about science communication. So the, the plan here is that when you see the slides on the top, uh, left-hand corner, mostly on the top left-hand corner, you'll see number one, and that refers to the first section of the talk. And sometimes you might see it on the right-hand side, but that's basically just to give you an idea of where we are in the, in the whole um, talk. So let's begin at this point. So if you look at this um, chart, you see that you have the diversification of modern birds right on the very top. You see the ballooning of the chart and you can easily recognize the different families of birds. And if you follow those lines down, you'll see that they've come to a point that we call the neonathines. And further down, if we go much, much further down to about 150 million years ago, we come to Archaeopteryx. And Archaeopteryx, is considered to be the first bird. So between Archaeopteryx and the Neonathines, we know that there are many different kinds of early birds that radiated. And these birds are typically what we call the Mesozoic bird radiation. Interestingly enough, molecular studies suggest that most of the modern lineages of birds actually stems to the Cretaceous. So even though we don't have many fossils of these early birds, we see that 
the molecular, um, or mo uh, today's molecular studies suggest that the ancestors must have been present already in the Cretaceous. But let's look at those Cretaceous birds. So if you look at this cladogram, don't worry if you can't um, read the names, it's just to show you that there's been such a great diversity of Mesozoic birds. Right at the very bottom, you'll see there are the Neonathines, which are the modern birds, but everything else here are all extinct birds. And the point that I want to make is that between Archaeopteryx and modern birds, there were so many different kinds of early birds. And some of them, like Archaeopteryx and JL Ornus that we see in the first um, picture, we see that these are the long tail birds. They typically have many vertebrae in the tails and we see that these birds are the very earliest birds that we have in the fossil record. But the other important thing is to notice that we have birds that are adapted for many different kinds of environments. So we have the typical um, birds like um, the um, uh, Confucius Ornus, which is a flying bird and one that, you know, that most people will recognize immediately as a bird. And the, the interesting thing about these birds is that even though they are in the Cretaceous, they have adaptations for particular lifestyle. By the time we come to Confucius Ornus, we see that the tail has been drastically reduced and we have what we call a pygo style. And Confucius Ornus was clearly a bird capable of flight. We have other birds that were very well adapted for an aquatic lifestyle. So the very well-known um, Hesperornis is um, kind of like a loon um, a kind of bird and it clearly has specializations in its skeleton for, um, for, for diving. Um, Ichthyornis is another um, flying bird and its very, very strong keeled sternum suggests that it was a very good flyer, so capable of powered flight like modern birds. And then we have another whole radiation of birds that are terrestrial birds. So clearly with arms this short, these birds were unable to fly and they were adapted for just terrestrial living, for land living birds, for flightless birds that radiated. So a great diversity of birds, even in the Mesozoic. In the talk that I gave um, earlier, uh, about two months ago, I told you about Confucius Ornus, and this is a bird that I personally worked on. And um, it's a very special bird for the fossil record because it's known by thousands of individuals. And most of the specimens preserve the um, skeletal material as well as a feathery integument. And this is also a special bird because it's the oldest bird with a beak. And in the fossil record, we know that there are two different morphotypes that can be recognized. Ones that have a long tail um, and ornamental uh, tail feathers and others that don't have tail feathers. And in my um, initial work on them in 2013, we basically identified uh, females and we were able to show that the different morphs reflect sexual dimorphism. And actually just last year, I did another study on these birds, which showed that they have very flexible growth strategies. But today I'm, I don't really want to focus on Confucius Ornus, but if anybody wants to know more, they can find the um, paper published in the anatomical records. In the late Cretaceous, besides the Patagopteryx bir a bird that I told you about, there were other birds that were also um, flightless birds. And this particular one was um, called Garganto avis. And as you can see by the name, it was a big bird. So that's why it was called Garganto avis. And it dates to about 70 million years. The interesting thing about this bird is that it is an island bird from the Ibero-American um, um, European archipelago and typically in what is now Southern France. And this bird actually, um, 
was interesting because it actually was a very slow growing bird. And we can see this from the bone microstructure. There were also other big birds in the Cretaceous, this particular one called Gastornis. And this, it, it looks like it's quite vicious, but in fact, it was a herbivore. And you can see there are no teeth in its jaws and it doesn't have a beak that is capable of tearing and biting. And we know that this Gastornis is related to the Mirangs or the Thunderbirds of Australia. And I'm going to tell you more about these Thunderbirds in the next few minutes. So, so just bear this in mind. So this Gastornis is the ancestor of the Mirangs. So this particular bird is a very interesting bird. It's, as you can see, it's a very duck-like bird and it's closely related to ducks and geese. It's a fascinating bird because it is clearly one of these um, uh, ancestors of modern birds that we can track right into the Cretaceous. So most of the time we, we have no fossils that actually give us a direct link to the modern birds. But Vegavus is actually very interesting because it, it suggests that it is very, very um, uh, closely related to ducks and geese. And in 2016, the syrinx was actually discovered. So the syrinx is the structure in birds that allows them to make sounds. And when the syrinx was actually discovered in this bird, it was found that it also was very similar to ducks and geese. And when they did a, when they did a scan of it, they were able to, um, to work out that it actually was capable of honking and quacking like geese today. So I think that would have been really cool to hear the squacks of ducks in the Cretaceous. Whilst there were also dinosaurs, as you can see here, we have a dromaeosaur. This is one of these uh, dromaeosaur dinosaurs kind of chasing this flock of geese. So 65 million years ago, we know that there was a big mass extinction event. And if you look at this diagram that's um, shown on the screen, you'll see that at that point, we see all of dinosauria go extinct, except for a subset of birds. So at that time, we know that there were small feathered meat-eating dinosaurs, we know that there were things that were basal birds like Archaeopteryx and Confucius owners. There were flying birds like, it, like the Enantionathines. There were the diving birds like the Ornithurines, like the Hesperonus. But from that subset of the Ornithurines, we know that modern birds actually originated. Everything else went extinct. And this is really quite a dramatic time for the history of life on Earth. And in fact, it is at this point that we get this big shuffling of the um, taxa that was around before and what came after. So interestingly enough, when we look at the uh, modern radiation of birds, so this is a cladogram showing you the modern birds and how they are all related to one another. And the numbers that you see at each of the branching points suggest when they actually branched off. And when you look at this cladogram, you'll see majority of the numbers actually fall in between 69 and uh, like about 58 million years ago. But some of them actually, you can see, extend even earlier. And what this suggests is that the early radiation, the diversification of modern birds actually began in the Mesozoic, so within the Cretaceous. And many of the modern bird families actually radiated, if not in the Cretaceous, certainly soon after the end of the end of the Cretaceous. So what is fascinating is that when we look at this chart, we, we understand from the molecular aspects when these branches occurred. But when we go to the fossil record, we see that if you look at this cladogram here, uh, sorry, if you look at this uh, chart here, I put the time scale just to explain to you that 
The red line indicates the Cretaceous uh, Paleogene extinction event. And then the next epoch immediately afterwards is called the Paleocene. And that Paleocene actually begins with a very, very different world. Before this, of course, we know that dinosaurs dominated all the terrestrial landscapes. We know that in the air, they were pterosaurs and they were early birds. And in the seas, of course, we had very big uh, marine reptiles like mosasaurs and ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. So, so all of these animals actually go extinct. But when the Paleocene starts, we see a very depauperate world. There are very few birds that we can find. And in fact, if you look on the left hand side, you'll see that there are just a few birds that have been found that clearly um, indicate to us that they were survivors of birds. But what's interesting is that none of those birds that I, I mentioned to you, many of those Mesozoic birds that were so abundant in the Mesozoic, none of them actually survived. But we see a different fauna of birds and some of them, it's just very few of them, some of them um, seem to be water birds and some of them are terrestrial birds. But they are really few and far between. And when we look at this time chart here, we'll see that many of the birds that we, we will talk about, we'll see that in the Eocene, okay, like I showed you in the cladogram, in the Eocene, we see the radiation of birds beginning to take off. There are many, many more bird um, species and taxa that we can recognize. And by the time we come to the Miocene, we see many of the lineages that you can recognize today. So this particular bird is an important one because this bird, the Sidiyazi abini, is one that was discovered in New Mexico and it dates to about 62 million years ago. So about three million years after the extinction, the big Cretaceous mass extinction event. And why it's interesting is because it's one of the oldest uh, fossils that we have of an arboreal crown bird. So it belongs to the coliformes and we know that these birds are fairly abundant today and from the fossil record we know that these birds also had a very very big radiation in, in, the, in the past. And molecular dating suggests that at least nine major land bed lin land bird lineages emerge soon after the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event. The, um, we, we have in the Paleocene, the uh, stem penguin called Waimanu, and this particular penguin is important because it suggests that the ancestors of penguins must have already diversified in the Mesozoic. And this particular one is not, um, it, it actually looks very cormorant-like, but clearly it's a penguin and it's more uh, similar in size to the yellow-eyed penguins, only about 150 centimeters big. So this brings me to the second part of the talk about modern big birds. So today we know that the ostrich is the largest land bird that we know of. In fact, just the largest bird. It stands about 2.8 meters tall and probably weighs about 156 kilograms. There are other reptiles that are pretty big, such as the cassowary or the emu or the rhea, but the ostrich is clearly the largest of all these birds. The emperor penguin is the tallest of the aquatic birds and it stands about 114 centimeters tall and probably weighs about 46 kilograms. The wandering albatross, as you all know, I'm sure, is the bird with the largest wingspan of about 3.5 meters. So these are the record holders today. But when we go into the fossil record, we see that there were many other large birds. 
For example, can you imagine a penguin taller than a human? Okay, so there was the, peng the penguin called Anthroponus, which is a giant penguin that is probably about 1.8 meters tall. And it certainly was enormous. It has um, uh, special um, bones in its feet that suggest that it um, used its feet also for moving in the water. And they clearly were enormous animals. And here you see um, one of the uh, bones, one of the um, femoral bones of this penguin compared to a modern one. And oh, this is quite cool because you see the emperor penguin stands at about 1.2 meters tall. And this other one is at 1.8 meters tall. The bird that holds the record for having the widest um, wingspan is this particular one called Pelagonus. And Pelagonus has a wingspan of 6.4 meters. It really was an enormous bird. And I'm sure some of you actually um, caught that article that came out um, last month, just towards the end of the month, about a new pelagonithid that was discovered from Antarctica. And this bird is probably from the same um, genus. And it is one of these birds that we call a pseudo tooth bird or a bony toothed bird. And so you must be saying, but birds don't have teeth. We know that early birds certainly had teeth like the dinosaurian ancestors, but these pelagornithids actually have pseudo teeth because their teeth are not made up of dentine and enamel, but their teeth are actually made of bone. And I have a slide in which I'm going to show you that. But this one is just to show you the pelagornis uh, sandesi compared to the wandering albatross and to a pigeon, as well as compared to a large um, pterosaur called Quetzalcoatlus. So this is um, part of the jaw of Pelagonus, and look at the teeth. These teeth are actually bony outgrowths. They're not really teeth in the sense of um, uh, what we describe, you know, with dentine and enamel. They actually are bony outgrowths of the jaw, and that's why they are called pseudo teeth. And we think that these birds were piscivores, and these teeth would help them um, catch um, um, a fish. So other giant birds that I'm sure you've heard of is the, uh, the moa or dinonus, and we see that the moa are actually pretty large, as you can see. They had very, very um, strong, powerful feet. They had these long necks. And we think that the moa were around from about 40,000 years. You can find their skeletons in the fossil record. But by the 1500s, all of these taxa went extinct. And most of it, we think, is by uh, human-induced activity. So interestingly, initially when the moa were discovered, people were kind of naming different species and it was, you know, a kind of uh, find a new, a new fossil and call it something new. But in fact, DNA analysis has suggested that um, many, many of the taxa actually are not real, that some of them actually clearly uh, are male and female, and um, there's been a much better resolution of their phylogeny. And, and we know that amongst these birds, the females are the taller and heavier morph. At the same time that the moa were around in New Zealand, there were also a very, very large eagle. It's called the Haast eagle, and it had a wingspan of about three meters. And this bird went extinct at about 500 years ago, around about the same time that we see the moa actually going extinct. 
So the um, other terrestrial giant birds that we know of in the fossil record are the Mirangs from Australia or the so-called panda birds. And here this wonderful picture compares one of these dromornithids, the Dromornis stertini, with a camel. And just look at how enormous this bird was. So this bird is interesting because it has very distinctive features and there are many fossils that have allowed us to understand something about this bird's anatomy. It's very well known and we find it from the Eocene right up to the Pleistocene. And we know that just about 30,000 years ago, it actually went extinct. So I'm going to tell you more about this bird because this is one of the birds that I've actually worked on and I'm currently working on as well. And then of course, they were the so-called terror birds. And you can see by their beaks why they were the terror birds. The phosphorescids were the top predators in the Cenozoic. And some of the largest of them are the Kalenken, which, were, which stood about 2.3 meters tall. And there have been many, many fossils that have been recovered. In fact, when I was in Argentina recently, I actually saw some of these fossils and they really look quite vicious. I mean, that beak is quite something. So just the beak is about 45 centimeters long and the skull itself is about 71 centimeters. So these are pretty big, vicious birds. And closer to home from Madagascar, we also have the elephant birds, which were, um, well, some of them were very large. There are several different taxa, and the largest um, is called Varombe. So it used to be Apionis maximus, but it's now known as Varombe, and it stood about three meters tall and weighed about 650 kilograms. So the elephant bird Apionis or Varombe actually um, competes with the Dromornithids for, for the record as the largest bird. So they, they, the largest of the um, uh, elephant bird and the largest of the Dromornis are literally about the same size. And it's very interesting that recently genetic studies have been done and it shows that the Apionis is a ratite and the closest relative is actually kiwis from New Zealand. The elephant bird also has a record of having laid the largest eggs for any vertebrate, so even bigger than dinosaurs. The circumference of the eggs are more than a meter, length of the eggs are about 34 centimeters, and they probably weighed about 10 kilograms. So these are fascinating birds, and it is so interesting that they, they've only been extinct very recently since about the 17th century. And again, because of human activity, and yet we have known so little about their biology. But earlier this year, um, I published a paper in the Biological Journal of the Linnaean Society about the biology of Apionis. So if you want to know more about them, you're certainly welcome to look up that paper. So this brings me to my research. My work deals um, with the microstructure of fossil bone. And using the bone microstructure, one is able to determine various aspects of the biology of extinct animals. So whether you're looking at dinosaurs or mammal-like reptiles or pterosaurs or fossil birds, you can actually deduce aspects of the biology of the animal by studying their bones, by studying the microscopic structure of their bones. So the section that you see here is actually of a dinosaur that is 190 million years ago. So the important thing to note is that even after millions of years, the microscopic structure of bone remains intact. And by studying those bones, the actual microscopic structure, we're able to get an understanding of how the bone formed. We can understand the, um, whether we're dealing with a juvenile or an adult, we can work out growth dynamics of the individual, we can understand something about when sexual maturity was reached, 
and we can also make deductions about biomechanical function and in some cases about disease as well. So fossil bone microstructure is really a very powerful tool in paleontology and allows us to understand the biology of extinct vertebrates. So as I mentioned earlier, I've done a lot of research on extinct big birds and um, as well as on uh, Mesozoic birds, but today my focus is really on the big birds. And um, I worked on Gaganto avis from the Cretaceous and that paper is published in uh, 2014. And then I've done some work with my postdoc, Delphine Angst, and um, other others, other collaborators, and we published this in 2017. And I'm going to tell you more about this work because I thought all of you probably know about the dodo. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the biology of the dodo. And then I'm also going to tell you a little bit more about my work on uh, Dromornis, which is a thunderbird, and then my ongoing work on Genionis. So basically, this is ongoing work and some of it has been published and I'll tell you more about that. And then the Apionis, as I mentioned, is the elephant bird from Madagascar and this one had been published earlier this year, in March this year in fact. And then, um, as you can see, I also have ongoing research with my uh, former postdoc Delphine Angs and we are working on the phosphorescence from Argentina, those terror birds and Gessornis. So these are ongoing research. So now I'm going to tell you about the dodo and then I'm going to tell you about the thunderbirds. Oh, and there's a picture of Delphine and um, that, that's actually in my lab here at UCT. And um, Delphine and I um, had this wonderful opportunity to work on the bone histology of the dodo and as you all know, the dodo is the kind of symbol for extinction, you know, because it, it is a bird that um, everybody knows was hunted to extinction. And it, it is so ridiculous that even though this bird overlapped with people, we know virtually nothing about its biology. I mean, most of the deductions about uh, the dodo are made um, as, as, are treated as though we, we, we make the deductions from um, a, a fossil. So basically we estimate its body size. We didn't know exactly how big it was. We, we think it stood about a meter tall. And it's actually so sad that there's really no written records about the biology of this animal. But what Delphine and I were able to do is we were able to um, section some of the bones of the dodo and use bone histology to decipher aspects of its biology. And we were very, very fortunate to get um, some material that we could section because, of course, to study the bone microstructure, we have to make thin sections of the bone that we look at under the microscope. And we were indeed very fortunate that we were able to get some material and this material actually comes from different collections and I just want to say a very big thank you to the Paul Curry family who actually um, gave us some of the material which we were able to section. Um, other material had come from the Julian Hume collection and we also got some from um, the Dodo Research Program. So basically the, the work that we did allowed us to combine um, different collections and try and get a good understanding of the biology of the dodo. And so what did we find? We were able to sample 22 bones, um, which included um, humeri or one humerus, tarso, metatarsi, tibiotarsi, and femora. And these different bones allowed us to uh, understand something about ontogenetic growth of the dodo. So we were able to distinguish between juveniles and adults. We were able to work out how long these animals took to grow up and we were able to deduce, uh, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> so 
sorry. <clears throat> and we were able to deduce aspects of the uh, biology, other aspects of the biology. So we was able to see that the juveniles have very, very distinctive bone tissue. And you can compare this to a modern bird and you'll see that modern juveniles have this kind of bone tissue. And um, it clearly shows that when this bird was growing, this bone tissue that you see on the right hand side shows us that the bird was growing very quickly, very rapidly, and all those um, those kind of darker spots that you see, these, these darker, larger areas, are areas where blood vessels would course through the bone. And then you see the area marked ICL. This is the bone that forms around the, um, the hollow of the bone, the medullary cavity of the bone. So one could actually deduce that here we were looking at a juvenile, but it wasn't a bird that was um, a young hatchling, but one that was more closer, closer towards being an adult. So it wasn't an adult yet, but it wasn't um, a very young bird also. The adult birds are very distinctive. They have um, uh, this feature at the top indicated by this double-headed red arrow. This tells us that this bone is growing very slowly at this point and these white arrows indicate lines of arrested growth, the legs, and these are deposited annually. So they can tell us that this bird was at least one, two, three, four, five, six years old. And it also indicates that this bird has virtually completed its growth. <clears throat> And we, we try to then determine in, um, if we look at these birds, we know that these lines of arrested growth are formed during, um, during times of stress. And we think, why would the dodo have been stressed? And we think that during the summertime, they experience cyclones and the food resources are probably more limited. And we think that those lines of arrested growth probably form during the summertime. The other interesting thing that we found is that inside these medullary cavities, so in the hollow part of the bone, we see that there are bony projections that grow from the inside surface of the bone in some of them. And when we examine the bones, we found that these bones actually have a very, very distinctive tissue. This tissue that's growing from the inner surface of the bone is called medullary bone. And medullary bone, we know from modern birds, only forms in females during ovulation. And these birds deposit the medullary bone during ovulation because when they lay the, the eggs, they actually need calcium to form the eggshell. And instead of taking calcium from the thin walls of their bones, they take it from this medullary bone. And so we clearly were able to identify females of the dodo, and we were able to, um, to understand something about when this occurred as well. We also found that in some of the birds that we studied, there were these large cavities that developed. And we know from modern birds that large resorption cavities like this indicated here in, in the bone wall happens during molting. And so we were able to deduce that the dodo, um, the, do the dodo bones that we were seeing, which had these large cavities, we know that they died during molting. And by putting all this together, we were able to actually work out a life history cycle of the dodo. So this is uh, really quite fascinating because until now, we, uh, there was no information about the biology of this bird. And now we have a good indication about what happens during the course of a single year in the life of the dodo. And this paper is published with Delphine as first author, and um, it's published in 2017 in Scientific Reports. So it's an open access journal, so anyone can look that up. 
So basically using bone histology, we were able to distinguish between juveniles and adults. We were also able to work out that it took at least six years for the birds to grow up to adult body size. We were able to identify the females because we found the medullary bone in some of the bones. And we were able to, um, to um, identify the birds that were undergoing molt. And we put this all together and we were able to deduce a life history cycle for the dodo. So it's a really fascinating study and I really urge you to look up the paper. So the other case study that I wanted to tell you about is the dromornithids. And this is a collaboration that I've been involved in with colleagues from Australia. And we know that this family of birds comprises of four genera and eight species, and they have a long history in um, the Australian fossil record. So they're known from the very early part of the Eocene, even some remains in the Paleogene. And we see that they are found from the Eocene right up to the Pleistocene. So they span a very, very long time range. And what we know is that this particular one, Dromona sturtini, was the largest of these Dromornithids. And this sorry, the one on the top, the Pleistocene one, is called Genionis, and this was the most recent Dromornithid, and this is the one that we think also came into contact with humans, and they also were exterminated. So the study that, um, that we did first began with the Dromornis turtini, and currently we are busy on Genionis, and our aim was basically to assess the biological implications of the histology. And these are my colleagues from Australia, from uh, Flinders University. So we have an Australian Research Council grant to do the work. And so far we've had uh, one paper published. We have an abstract published and, and actually I'm busy writing up as we, as we literally speak. I have a paper that I'm busy with that uh, we hope to submit. So Trevor Worthy is a very well-known um, uh, person. He's actually originally from New Zealand, but is now based at Flinders. And um, Warren Handley is based in Australia. So this chart, I'm going to zoom into it. Here we see the Dromornithids. And as I mentioned earlier, they related to that um, Cretaceous uh, bird, Gastornis. And this basically is the phylogenetic um, um, tree for these animals. And we see that they actually are sister taxa to the galliformes and they are the gesorniciforms. And here you see some examples of the bones. Um, first of all, let's, let's look at the skeletons. Um, here you have an ostrich, and in the background you have a reconstruction of a dromornithid. And you can see it was an enormous bird. It stood about three meters tall, and their bones were just enormous. So here we have, let me see who is this. This is Warren Handley holding um, a femur of the dromornis, and we have a spectacular size range from babies right up to adult size. So here you have Trevor holding a femur of a young hatchling as compared to the adult. And this is Tibiotasi of um, Dromornithus as well. So they really um, beautifully preserved specimens. Many of them have been excavated from the Northern Territory. And um, we, we have been able to get access to these bones. So the first part of the study actually dealt with the understanding just the anatomy of the bird. So doing comparative morphology, estimating the mass and doing landmark geometric morphometrics. And we found that clearly they were also sexually dimorphic and the females were the smaller uh, of these morphs and um, the males were probably um, about uh, maximum weight, about 610 kilograms, whereas the female average was about 451 kilograms. 
So we think that the huge size, oops, sorry, that was supposed to be, ah, oh, sorry, sorry. We think that the huge, they, they probably um, developed this huge size to protect the growing chicks from predators because at the time that they were around, we know that there were dog size um, thylacines and marsupial lions also around. So being big was also an advantage. Um, so this is the material that we were able to study. So 13 femora, 6 debutasi, and 2 tasmetatasi. And also we were able to choose individuals um, through a different size range, especially for the femora. So typically in a modern bird, this is what you will see. You see this triple layered structure with the outer band, the OCL and the inner circumferential lamellae, the inner band, and then the middle band is the band that depos gets deposited during early ontogeny. Okay, so this is typically what you see in a modern bird. In the juveniles of the Dromonas, we see that we have that same typical um, bone tissue that indicates a rapid growth, but of course, these, bo these birds are terrestrial birds, so they have much thicker wall bones, and the, all that cortex is, or that whole bone wall, indicates that it's rapidly forming. And as they get older, we see that they develop these alternating cycles in growth. These double-headed arrows are indicating you, um, indicating to you cycles that are being deposited. And in between the cycles, there's a different kind of tissue that forms. So we see these um, alternating bands of tissue suggesting that they have different um, uh, growth patterns during different times of the year. And that's just a high magnification of the same thing. And when we look at the largest of these individuals, we see that the cycles have now changed. And instead of just having those bands, we now just get a line. So this line that forms in here, the, the small arrows are indicating here 15 legs that can be counted in the large individual. And a high magnification shows you these lines of arrested growth that develop. And they clearly indicate that there were periods where growth actually just was arrested. There was no growth that was occurring. And then during the unfavorable season, there was no growth. And then when better conditions arrived, they would actually resume growth. We were also able to identify medullary bone in some of these bones. In fact, five out of 21 of the bones had medullary bone. And um, this is a low magnification and here's a high magnification. So this bone tissue is very distinctive and um, one can actually clearly identify that the tissue in the medullary cavity is different from the tissue in the bone wall. And we also see very distinctive changes in terms of the bone tissue that develops. And we see that in the largest individual that clearly it has stopped growing. So we see that growth continues cyclically, cyclically for about 15 years, and then we see it stops growing. So the conclusions for the study is that Dromonas experience cyclical growth, and we certainly know that it reached sexual maturity before skeletal maturity, because we find that medullary bone in individuals that have not yet reached skeletal maturity. We know that they took about 15 years to reach an adult body size. So they were more case strategists taking a long time to grow up. And we believe that those growth strategies that we see in their bones are probably related to prevailing environmental conditions. And we think that that slow growth and the arrest in growth may have been during the summer months. In fact, in a very recent study that I've just, just um, submitted, and it's actually in press at the moment in zoology, and this paper is on modern kangaroos, and even modern kangaroos we see have the cyclical growth patterns, and we know from uh, physiology studies on modern kangaroos that they experience these um, 
difficult, stressful times during the summer months. And so we've also hypothesized that in Dromornis, the slow growth and the growth arrest that we see are probably occurring during the summer. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the two case studies that I wanted to tell you about. And I just want to mention that um, at the moment, we are still busy working on, the, um, on this Dromornis study. And our focus now is to look at the EUC in Dromornis, which is called Genionis. And every year, my colleagues in Australia are going out to, um, to the fossil site, and they're digging up bones, and they bring them back. And I literally am working on these very, very newly discovered material. And so far, we have interesting findings, and um, I hope that uh, we will have a wonderful story to say in the next few months. So that really brings me to um, my last um, slide. And this is really to tell you all about my um, online course called Extinctions Past and Present. So this is a free um, online course offered through UCT and it's available through FutureLearn. And I should tell you that it's ranked top 50 in the world. And so even better than that, it's ranked number two. So it's really a world-class course and I urge you to join. The next one is going to be starting on the 7th of November. So definitely it's one that should, you should certainly, um, I hope if you haven't already done it, I hope that you will participate on it. It's really uh, completely free and you can do it wherever you are in the world. So I hope that you will, um, I hope that I will meet you there um, on this course. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. I think Melissa is going to come back. Yes. <laughs> yes, I am. Hey, Anisia, thank you so, so much for that. What an incredible presentation. I certainly learned so much there and I can only imagine what it must have been like to listen to the dawn chorus of the Cretaceous period and listen to those <laughs> quackers honking along or looking into the eyes of a giant penguin standing at 1.8 meters tall, which is about my height or even seeing that Pelagornis fly through overhead with that 6.4 meter wingspan and its bony jaws or the rumbling earth as a 650 <laughs> kilogram elephant bird approaches. Thank you so much for helping us glimpse this prehistoric era. I think it could have been quite an adventure being a prehistoric birder. One might find themselves on the menu, <laughs> I imagine. But um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I had absolutely no idea that you could use those lines of arrested development, almost like a tree ring, to look at the ages of bird's bone. It was just simply fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing your deep knowledge and vast experience of these bygone birds with us tonight. Now, before we take questions, I just want to remind everybody that um, we please, when you exit, you'll be directed to a post-webinar survey. It's a nice quick one tonight, so please do take the time to just fill it in for us. And next week, we're really excited to welcome Vernon Head, world-renowned author of books including The Search for the Rarest Bird and Featherings. Vernon's also a member of BirdLife South Africa's board of directors and a previous chairman of that board. And Vernon will be sharing his experiences with conservation <clears throat> and birding and what inspired him to put these thoughts and feelings into his best-selling books. So be sure to tune in for this fascinating webinar next week. Now, if you're listening via Zoom, please do type your questions into the <clears throat> Q&A box. Or if you're listening on Facebook, you can type them into the comment feed and I'll direct these to Anisia. Thank you so much. I'm going to start us off with one from Christoph, who's tuning in all the way from Belgium. Now, what's amazing to me is we've got these amazing representations of these birds with beautiful colored feathers and all sorts of uh, beak shapes and um, really well illustrated diagrams. How do you get to the point where you can almost color in these fossils that you find, please, Kraft? So, so some of the fossils actually, um, in many cases, we rely on the anatomy of the bones to reconstruct the birds. Okay, so in the case of the terror birds, they do have these hook-like kind of beaks, and we know for sure that they had this. The color of the of the beak itself, we don't really know. That's an artist's imagination. But in some of the birds, there are melanosomes preserved. And the melanosomes, which are these organelles that preserve pigment, they allow us to reconstruct the color of the birds. So not all the birds that you see um, are basically um, 
the, the colors are true, but some of them clearly, we, with them in there are melanosomes present, we can reconstruct the color of birds. Fantastic. That's absolutely fascinating. I remember listening to a podcast once where they said the, the sort of illustrators of these fossilized creatures can get a bit creative. And if you think of something like an elephant's trunk, if you looked at an elephant's skeleton, you'd never know that that trunk was on its face. But uh, I suppose you have to take a bit of creative license here and there to bring these animals to life. <laughs> Exactly, but that's why it's so important to study anatomy because you know then you can actually make uh, realistic um, reconstructions of the animals. You know, you're not just kind of thumb sucking it, but it's based on what you can assess from the living world and also how you know about um, the morphology of the skeleton. Absolutely, thanks so much. Now, Penny Abbott's asking: Are there any significant fossil sites for birds in southern Africa? So the most significant one is, of course, the Langebahnweg. So this is a Pliocene fossil site. So nothing like deep time that I was talking about. So I was mainly talking about 55 million years ago, or, or even the Mesozoic sort of um, uh, maybe 90 to 100 million years ago. But in um, South Africa, we have a Pliocene locality that is dated between five and seven million years. And there are many fossils there, but those birds, of course, are just like your modern form. So there's nothing really um, very different or special about them. They are like the modern birds that we see today. Brilliant. Then um, Gareth Coombs on Facebook is asking if you found enough fossils that show stomach content. It's obviously a difficult thing to do, but have we been able to look at stomach content in these fossilized yes, creatures? Certainly. So there have been wonderful examples, even from Mesozoic birds, where we have um, preservation in some cases of seeds within the um, abdominal cavity. Some of them have um, um, gastrolites, so like moles that suggest that they were um, helping to digest food. And um, there, there are clearly some indications of, um, of, of, what do you say, the diet of the bird preserved as fossils as well. Brilliant. And then I suppose it sort of follows on a bit from that. But Robert Smith is asking, does the process of pre-mineralization not destroy those microstructures in the fossilized bones? No. So that's what's so cool about bone microstructure is that even after millions of years, we still can study the bone tissues. And what we, what we say is that there's been angstrom changes, so absolutely minute changes in the organization of the bone structure. Because if we look at bone, we know that bone consists of an organic component and an inorganic component. The organic component are the blood vessels and the nerves and the soft tissue that makes up bone. But the hardness that we have of bone actually comes from the mineral component, from the inorganic part. And when an animal dies, all that organics decompose, but the mineral is preserved. And because the mineral and the organics have such a close connection during life, even though the organics have decomposed, the mineral tissue is preserved and it preserved the microstructure intact. Brilliant. It's really phenomenal, yeah. That is, yeah, absolutely incredible that that can, can last for so long. Now, I see a, a fellow academic is online, Professor Andrew McKechnie. Great to have him with us. He says, hi, thanks for an absolutely fascinating talk. I've been telling my students for years that the body, the body mass of Apionis maximus is estimated to have been around 450 kilograms. Could I ask you to say a little bit more about the new estimate of 650 kilograms, please? So um, I haven't actually done that study. There's a study that was published um, 2018, I think it was. It was a very new study on uh, the phylogeny of Apionis. And um, that, that recent assessment is now of this new um, genus that has been identified called Varombe. So it, the species is Varombe titan. And Varombe is the one that they've estimated to be about 650 kilograms. And I remember when this paper came out, that's why when I was telling this, telling you about the Dromornithus and Apionis, there's always been this debate. The Australians say, we have the biggest bird. And then the, from Africa, we want to say, oh, we have the biggest bird from Madagascar. But in fact, they are very similar big birds. You know, they really are enormous birds. And um, I think 
I, I'm not 100% sure now, but I think that when the analysis of the Varombe was done, they used the um, tibiotarsus circumference. And that is a standard usually for working out the body mass of birds. So I think that's what they did. But that, that paper was actually um, published by, I forget the guy's name now. Um, yeah, but certainly um, that wasn't my particular work. So I can't say for sure exactly how it was done. Fantastic. No, thanks so much, Prof. And I'm sure Andrew will enjoy updating his slides with that new information. Um, we've got a question here from Max sticking with the Dromonithids. Um, he said that you mentioned sexual dimorphism in this group of birds. Um, what sort of data is out there to support this? If you wouldn't mind just elaborating on this a bit, please. Well, what, what we had was uh, certainly the fact that we had um, these uh, medullary bone in, in the birds. So we clearly knew which were the birds that were female. And then when um, uh, Warren Handley did the morphometrics uh, on the birds, he did geometric morpho morphometrics on these big sample of the Dromornithid, so the whole big um, morphometric sample, he found that he could separate them out using geometric morphometrics into two different morphs. And the interesting thing was that I wasn't I wasn't told which morphs I was looking at. I was just given these, um, these samples and said, you know, would I look at the histology of these birds? And sure enough, as I was busy with these, I pulled out these ones that had medullary bone. And all the ones with medullary bone were the group that fell with those um, smaller morph. So it basically supported his, um, uh, his uh, postulation of these uh, females and males and medullary bone was in these um, uh, smaller morph. Fantastic. Now, speaking of females, we've got a question that's a bit more about you and not the dinosaurs. Penny would like to know, <laughs> how did you actually get into this area of specialization? What was your sort of journey into the paleontological world? Uh, I began as a zoologist. I, um, I wanted to be a science teacher and I did the usual botany, zoology, maths, physics, you know, the usual works. And um, in my third year of zoology, I did a module in paleontology and I was completely taken by this. It really drew me in. And then when I did honors in zoology, still zoology, honors in zoology, I did again a module in paleontology and by that time I was uh, completely hooked and since then I did masters and PhD in paleontology. In, for me it was a way in which it brought together all my undergraduate experiences because I could use my knowledge of biology, histology, physiology and bring that all together to try and understand the biology of these extinct animals. And I have really thoroughly enjoyed my journey and it's been wonderful to be able to breathe life into these animals. Absolutely, and what a successful journey it has been. Um, I suppose I can, I can give you the, the platform here for a second, just to tell us a bit about the two books that you have produced so far. And I don't know if you wanna share anything about the new ones that you've got up your sleeve. But uh, please, please do tell us a bit about the books you have produced, if anybody's interested in learning a bit more about this prehistoric world. Okay, so um, I think a wonderful introduction into, just as you said, the prehistoric world is my book called Fossils for Africa. And this book is really interesting is be because most of the time when we learn about um, the fossil history, we often will, will hear about fossils found in North America, fossils found in, I don't know, in Europe. Uh, people don't really understand the South African and African fossil history. And what this book does is takes us through this whole journey of life on Earth. So we look at the earliest evidence for life on Earth, which really comes from South Africa, from 3.8 billion year old rocks. Sure. And we look at those fossils and we then look at the um, uh, progressively how these different um, uh, forms evolve. So how did we get from microorganisms 
to multicellular organisms, to more complex organisms, and then the radiation of these different forms. So this book is a wonderful book. I really love doing it. It is really this whole story. If ever you want to know, so where do insects come from? Or where do, where, how, how did mammals originate? Or how are dinosaurs and mammals not related? You know, that really tells you the story. So Fossils for Africa is this wonderful book. And then of course, if kids love dinosaurs, there's famous dinosaurs for Africa, but I should say, wait for the new one. The new one is coming out in March and it's uh, basically called African Dinosaurs. And it's, it's a kind of um, updated version of famous dinosaurs of Africa. And it's such a pity I don't have my cover here because I've just settled on the cover for the new book and it's awesome, it's really awesome. Yeah. And one of the coolest things about the new book is that just in the past maybe three years, there's been so much of new work that has come out on African dinosaurs, particularly on Spinosaurus, which is a dinosaur found in North Africa. So Morocco, Egypt, Algeria, those parts of the world. And the Spinosaurus is now the only um, aquatic dinosaur that we know of. And it's aquatic based on um, uh, its skeleton. There are features in its skeleton that suggest it had an aquatic lifestyle and also on isotopic analysis. So it's really, really a special dinosaur. And the cover features Spinosaurus as well. So yeah, really cool. And then the, ne the next one that I have in the pipeline is with Dolan Kindersley. And um, so I'm sure you all know the, the wonderful children's publishers, they, the UK based publishers, and the book is on dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals. And that's coming out in March. So yeah, I've been very busy this lockdown. <laughs> it sounds like it, fantastic. And what a great collection of books to, to sink our teeth into. And I can't wait to see the new ones come out. I'll definitely need to get a copy of those and, and give them a good read. Um, you mentioned the sort of diversification of animals. Um, we've got a question here from Robert asking, did the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum stimulate the diversification of birds as it did with the stimulation and the radiation of mammals? So th that's what we think. I mean, because we do see the spike in the adaptive radiation of so many groups. I mean, we see the radiation of mammals, we see the radiation of um, birds, and we think that this probably has to do with the environmental changes that were happening at the time. So it's definitely very, very likely. Brilliant. And Betsy's asking, um, she recollects reading somewhere that birds may be classified in the class reptilia, not so much in the aves. Can you split that up for us a little bit and just explain the difference between reptilia and aves, please? Okay, so basically, if we look at um, reptilia is the whole big group, okay? So aves is really just a subset of the, um, of the reptilia, just like how you have dinosaurs being a subset of uh, reptilia, the same way birds are a subset, the aves are a subset of dinosauria, which are a subset of reptilia. So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a way, same way we can refer to ourselves as non-mammalian, as mammalian therapsids, because we are all therapsids. And it's just the further, deeper classification that we actually have. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah, I know. That sounds great. <laughs> so birds are reptiles, but not all reptiles are birds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. There we go. <laughs> now, if anyone wants to know, um, in terms of that bone development that you showed us, are the bones developing from the inside out or the outside in? So that's an interesting question because when bones grow, they are different kinds of growth. Okay, so when they grow, if you think about a, um, can you see me? Because I, I'm not sure if you can see me. Do you see me? Yes, I can see you. <laughs> okay, so if I hold this glass up, do you see this? Yes, we can. Okay, so if we look at this and we think this is the bone wall, the rim of the glass is the bone wall. Okay, so when an animal is growing, generally they grow from the, from the outside outwards. Okay, that is what we call periosteal growth. But from the inside, from the inner part of the bone, where you would get the medullary cavity, this is the marrow cavity or medullary cavity, around that area, we also can get bone growth. And that is called endosteal growth. So bones can grow outwards 
as well as inwards, but the different kinds of bone tissues that form depending on where they're actually forming from. I hope that's clear enough. Yeah, I think so. That's fantastic. And uh, you were mentioning those um, lags or the, the sort of arrested growth periods. Um, we've yes. got a question from Bailey. I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase a bit here, but Bailey's saying, um, what happens if you've got, say, two bad growing seasons in a year? How would that potentially influence your ability to, to age those birds with those lags? That, that's such a good question. So, uh, you know, Bailey, I, I, I'm not sure if where, where you are, but if you find my kangaroo paper, it's online at the moment. It's in a pre-proof stage. And one of the things I found with the kangaroos was that there are some times when there are multiple layers of these bands that form. And these indicate that there are multiple stressful periods within a season. And what's so interesting is that when we uh, treat those as one band, so we can get sometimes two or sometimes three of these um, uh, lines of arrested growth that form. And um, I've treated them, uh, I, I basically say in the paper that I treated them as, as a single event happening during, not a single event, but happening during one season, okay? So that you can use it for aging. And when we plot that, together with the known data on kangaroos, it actually matches. So it looks like it's a reliable way to, um, to, to determine that even if you get multiple bands forming, we know that they all those bands are forming during the summer season, and there could be multiple events that were so stressful for the animal that they form these um, arrest lines. Sure, that is absolutely fascinating, Prof. And I think, um, speaking of references, we've got a, a comment here from Linda just asking if it's maybe possible to get a, a list of all of the different citations we've, we've spoken about tonight. And um, what I can maybe do is if I get those from you, I can post them on our Conservation Conversations website underneath the link to your recording. And if people do want to follow up on some of the amazing research that you've shared with us, they can then track them down via that page. Yeah. So, so, Melissa, if they're looking for just my research, I mean, you can just uh, Google it and find me on uh, Google Scholar because all of that will be listed. But if they wanted, did I mention? Yeah, I mentioned other papers as well. So if I could do both. I mean, you know, my papers okay. also on the UCD website, they should be up. They're not probably with the most recent stuff, but they probably up to date till last year, I think. Super. No, thanks so much, Prof. Yeah, it'll, it'll be great. I think everybody's really enjoyed hearing about all of this amazing research. And um, we've got one more question here from Zach, and he's asking if birds were already pretty diverse by the Cretaceous extinction, what is it about them that as a group allowed them to survive? That's the million dollar question. Actually, Zach, not all of them survive. That's what's so interesting is that we know, and I hope you attended my evolution of birds um, talk that I gave previously, because when we, when we spoke in that talk, we said that when we look at the, um, the, the, um, the, towards the crown group of dinosaurs, we know that many of the dinosaurs were very derived dinosaurs were also very similar to birds. And yet we know that the birds that were around at the time, not all of those birds survived. The one that I told you about, that rich diversification, we have absolutely no idea why they didn't survive. I mean, we don't get Sapionis after the uh, end of the Cretaceous. We don't get any of the Hesperonithornis or the Ichthyornis, which was a flying bird. None of them survived the um, Cretaceous tertiary ex uh, extinction event. So we don't really know what happened there. But what we do understand is that they obviously was, well, we think there was some um, perhaps physiological reason why some birds survive and others didn't. And I wonder if Andrew McKechnie is still online because it could be very interesting. I mean, I've kind of always toyed with this idea that there must have been physiologically something that allowed the, the, um, the, the radiation of modern birds. So it might have been very sparse and very few of them that made it through, like we had the Vegavis, but hardly anything else. But penguins, ancestors of penguins made it through. You know, what is it? Do they have more adaptability? What is it about them 
maybe physiologically there was some difference yeah but that's a great question Zach absolutely and and definitely one I suppose we will continue to try and unlock the mysteries of as we go along um unfortunately it looks like Andrew has signed off so we'll have to take that up with him offline but um Great, Prof, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through, but just um, from my side, I'd really like to say a huge thank you to you. That was absolutely fascinating. I learned so much and it was just so cool to have, as you say, all of these amazing creatures getting a bit of life breathed back into them and, and learning about this bygone era. Um, thank you so much for coming on to Conservation mm -hmm. Conversations and sharing your skills with us. And I don't know if you have any last comments for everyone listening before we close off tonight. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. And um, yeah, I hope I've opened your minds to the world of prehistoric birds. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Prof. All right, everybody. A big good night from me to all of you. Happy birding you. and keep your eyes on the skies and keep enjoying all of those birds out there. I'll see you again, same time, same place next week, seven o'clock every Tuesday. Thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. And thank you, Prof. We will see you next week. Keep safe, everybody. Good night. Thank you.